This is Chris Chopic at Cities Alive in New York City. We're gonna be talking to Dr. Ken Yang about his 50 years of experience doing biophilic design. Who am I? My name is Ken Yang. I'm a purveyor of fine green architecture. And I've been doing it for nearly 50 years now, since 1971. So um, I'm one of the early pioneers, if you like, of this field. When I first started, people said I was, said I was a hippie. So, um, but you know, now they thought, you know, he had a vision, you know, and so it's a, it's a, it's a long road for me. I still a lot of things to do before I start pushing daisies, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's what I do. Green architecture, green master plans, and we, our work is ecology based. And so I think it's a much more authentic way of approaching green design than energy or carbon or any other criteria. So can you tell me a little bit about um, your experience in that 50 years and what what kind of legacy has, has been born from all of that uh, diligent effort? Well, for, for a good part of the 50 years, it was a struggle because a lot, a lot of people did believe what I did. And, I, and when I started practice, it was very difficult to implement it. I had to start you know, from a rather uh, obtuse way as low energy design. Um, but something happened in the 90s. In the 90s, a lot of people just jumped up and said, Oh, we have to do something about the environment. And that's when engineers got into it, architects got into it, and so come the, the naughty noughties, which is what we are now, the 2000 plus, um, every architect claimed to do green design, which is good. And it's also bad because, you know, a lot of the work is basically greenwash. It's not really very deep green design. And a lot of them negate the ecology of the land, which is, which is what green design should be about. So negating the, the ecology of the land. So they're developing on a, on a site and they're eliminating the ecological services, is that what you mean? Well, no, when it, you know, ecology means you're looking at it holistically. That means you're looking at it in, the, in terms of materials that's used. Uh, and materials, the ecology of materials is the impact from the time you take it from the land, you transport it, you fabricate it, you produce it, and we get to the site. And it doesn't end there. It, it's what happens to the materials at the end of its useful life. And instead of just going to the city dump, it needs to be uh, recycled and, and, and replenished and be reintegrated back into nature. So that is the entire life cycle of material, um, which is um, part of what ecological design should be. But you, but you know, when you build on a piece of land, you displace the ecology. So whatever you do, and some parts of the site, you can, some parts of the land you can displace without too much detriment to the environment, and some parts which is ecologically sensitive, um, you, you have to be very careful. And so the whole, for instance, the whole approach of, of ecological land use planning is to map the land and study the geology, the soils, the groundwater, the vegetation, and the climate to identify parts of the site where you can locate buildings without significantly affecting the ecology. And so that's part of the, the issue of ecological design. And so, um, you know, ecology is, covers a multitude of sins, if you like. Okay. Um, so you've had all of this experience and a lot of pushing the rope uphill and with lots of resistance. What do you see emerging and being part of the 20-year the future that's on our horizon now? Well, I'm optimistic. I'm an eternally optimistic person. I believe that the world will do something about it, um, despite whatever political situation may be at the moment in the U.S. Um, but uh, the movement is there. A lot of governors of, of different states, especially in California, will not respond to the way that the federal government wants it to respond. And so, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. This is not just in the U.S. This is everywhere in the world. You know, people realize that something has to happen. But whatever, what will trigger off the major... Um, changes could be a major disaster. Something happened and people say, oh, you know, better do something about it now, you know, and or sea rises and, and a good part of New York is flooded and, 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 and uninhabitable. New York, Miami, you know, the, 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 the eastern seaboard would be significantly affected. And when that happens, people think, oh, better do something about it now. We better, you know, then, then there's a rush and, and to do something. But my view is that 20 years ago, if you ask me about ecological design, it is preventive, it's, it's anticipatory of any negative impacts on the environment. But today, 20 years later, it's a race and rescue mission. We haven't got time anymore. We just, you know, not only do we have to make sure that what we build will have least impact on the environment, we have to repair all the damage that's been done in the past because a lot of emissions, a lot of the damage that's done affects not just present day, will continue into the future. So our next generation will be affected. A green roofs for healthy cities. Well, green roofs do many things. Uh, in terms of engineering, it lowers the uh, heat island effect of the city. In other words, you know, a lot of cities, because of the of the uh, inorganic aspects of the city, the concrete, the roofs, and the mass, and the huge, uh, you know, masonry mass, increases the temperature of about two to three degrees over what it is in the countryside. 
Now, this is okay on a normal day, but as you know, in places like New York, there are about two to three weeks in the year when you actually super heats, and that is going to affect you know the larger people, and it could even affect the poorer, <coughs> the less, um, the less um, the people are less have less opportunities, you know, less privilege, and so um, that's the first the engineering effect of green roofs, which is. Um, uh, thermal effect on cities. But well, second is that green roofs improves the biodiversity of the city. And what have people have found is that by putting green roofs, species that were lost in that particular loca locality came back again. And so it enhances the biodiversity and, and that, and that of, you know, of, of not just birds, but invert invert invertebrates and all the other sort of, you know, uh, you know life forms um, that come back to the city. And that's very good. And so we should green, not just roofs, but we should green walls, we should green interiors, we should have green balconies, and not only green, we should grow food, we should be self-productive. You know, that's my view about uh, green of cities. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Okay. Great.